Perel, how are you doing? Did you get any sleep or have you been up uh, all morning and day? Okay, so about when uh, when you hopped into the stream, probably. I mean, that's not too bad. I hope you get more sleep tonight. I'll probably do another uh, game stream tonight, but probably not as late as uh, uh, as four thirty. Especially since I have a story time again tomorrow. Yeah, I, I'm having a lot of fun with Genshin Impact. I'm thinking I should probably do a quest next, but I've been having such fun just exploring. Have you been, uh... Ooh, oh, I love pot roast. I love the potatoes that go with pot roast, too. I think those are my favorite potatoes of all. It's pot roast or pot roast or stew potatoes. Just cooking at a low heat for a long time in the juices of, uh, yeah, of a roast or a beef stew or something like that. My sister and I are super excited about, uh, about stew season coming up. Oh, I would say I hope you enjoy, but I know you're going to enjoy. Enjoy for me. Not really sure what I'm going to be making tonight. I should switch over. Oh, hi, John. How are you doing? We're talking about pot roast and stew and stuff. I'm going to switch over to this screen, but have Maestro showing. Because I'm trying this new thing. Yeah, I was thinking about it this morning. Um, Wally World has a complete package of meat and all veggies for like, ooh, $20 here. Nice. I think it's going to be a couple of weeks before my sister and I start doing stew because uh, next, well, this upcoming week, it's going to be back up in the mid to high 80s, which I'm not excited about. We had enough of this. I was uh, really pleased that, uh, like, I was looking through pictures of Oscar Wilde to use to make my picture of Dorian Gray, and of course there's the one where he's sitting and, you know, is leaning over and resting his hand, or his, resting his chin on his knuckles of his hand, and that's the, you know, the famous one that everybody knows about, and I was thinking of using that, but I'm like, no, doesn't quite fit in with what I'm looking for. And then I found this one, I'm like, I don't know if the picture of Dorian Gray is standing or sitting or anything. Ooh, ugh, 87 for you. Is it humid or dry, 87? Because I know that you have gotten quite a few, um, like, storms uh, where you are over the summer. Uh, but yeah, anyways, I saw this picture, and I'm like, that is the picture I want as my Dorian Gray, and come to find out that it was actually a full-length picture of, uh, or a full-length Dorian Gray in the portrait, so that was serendipitous, even though I had to, sadly, cut off his, uh, cut him off at the knees here, just because the photo was just way too long for the frame that I chose. Of course, I could have Frankensteined it, I'm seeing. Ah, yes. I've never really um, experienced a humid heat. Because, you know, I've lived here all of my life. Except for, like, 
like two years I lived in Colorado for uh, college, but that was another pretty dry place where I was. I have heard stories. My brother uh, lived in Savannah for several years for his college time. So, you know, they get 99 degree weather with 99% humidity. It's kind of the status quo there. And, you know, he goes from having um, forest fires every late summer to having hurricanes every late summer. But now he's down in Southern California. He still thinks he's a Northern Californian, but I told him, if you have a season pass to Disneyland, that means you are a Southern Californian. I don't care what you say. Ooh, yeah, I would say so. I We're probably gonna have to do that this week. We don't want to, because It'll be nice to not pay so much for uh, electrical, but I mean, it's either that or have her brains boil. And, oh, okay. So you know exactly about that. Yeah. So my sister and I actually, we try to do two full months a year of just, um, no AC or no heater and usually it's about like October and May but not sure how this October is gonna go yeah hot and humid <laughs> pretty much all right well I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started so I'm gonna switch uh, our little meowing maestro off Hey, Snockings, are you going to join me for story time? Come on up. Go ahead. Come on. Snockings. Am I going to have to lift you up? Oh, hey, Maestro. Do you want to sit in my lap, too? No, they're just both staring at me. <laughs> well, I'm going to start reading, you guys, okay? If you want to stay and listen, you can. I have a lap you can sit in. Snockings doesn't care about story time. Maestro, on the other hand, he loves being read aloud too, but we'll see if he wants to share me. All right, here we go. Meowing Maestro is being turned off, and we will go ahead and get started. Chapter 8. It was long past noon when he awoke. His valet had crept several times on tiptoe into the room as if to see... Uh, to see if he was stirring, and had wondered what made his young master sleep so late. Finally, his bell sounded, and Victor came in softly with a cup of tea and a pile of letters on a small tray of old cerves, uh, or cerve, yeah, china, and threw back the olive satin curtain with it, their shimmering blue lining that hung in front of the three tall windows. Monsieur has not slept this morning, he said, smiling. Oh, has well slept this morning. What o'clock is it, Victor? asked Dorian Gray. One hour and a quarter, monsieur. How late it was. He sat up and, having sipped some tea, turned over his letters. One of them was from Lord Henry and had been brought by hand that morning. He hesitated for a moment and then put it aside. The others he opened listlessly. They contained the usual collection of cards, invitations to dinner, tickets for private views, programs of charity concerts, and the like that are show, uh, showered on fashionable young men every morning during the season. There was a rather heavy bill for a chaste silver Louis, uh, yeah, Louis Cannes toilet set that he had not yet had the courage to send on to his guardians, who were extremely old-fashioned people, and did not realize that we live in an age when ne unnecessary things are our only necessities. And there were several very courteously worded communications from Germain Street uh, money lenders, offering to advance any sum of money at the moment's notice, and at the most reasonable rates of interest. After about ten minutes, he got up and 
throwing on an elaborate dressing gown of silk embroidered cashmere wool, passed into the onyx paved bathroom. The cool water refreshed him after his long sleep. He seemed to have forgotten all that he had gone through. A dim sense of having taken part in some strange tragedy came to him once or twice, but there was the unreality of a dream about it. As soon as he was dressed, he went into the library and sat down to a light French breakfast that had been laid out for him on a small round table close to the open window. It was an exquisite day. Uh, yeah, somehow I lost my place there. It was an exquisite day. The warm air seemed laden with spices. A bee flew in and buzzed around the blue dragon bowl that had filled with uh, that filled with sulfur yellow ro uh, yeah sulfur yellow roses stood before him. He felt perfectly happy. Suddenly, his eye fell on the screen that he had placed in front of the portrait, and he startled. To cool for the monsieur? asked his valet, uh, putting an omelette on the table. I shut the window? Dorian shook his head. I'm not cold, he mur murmured. Is it all true? Had the portrait really changed? Or had it been simply his own imagination that had made him see a look of evil where there had been a look of joy? Surely a painted canvas would, could not alter. The thing was absurd. It would serve as a tale to tell Basil some day. It would make him smile. And yet, how vivid was his recollection of the whole thing? First in the dim twilight, and then in the bright dawn. He had seen the touch of cruelty round the warped lips. He almost dreaded his valet leaving the room. He knew that when he was, gone, uh, when he was alone, he would have to examine the portrait. He was afraid of certainty. When the coffee and cigarettes had been brought and the man turned to go, he felt a wild desire to tell him to remain. As the, door, uh, as the man stood waiting for his orders, Dorian looked at him for a moment. I am not at home to anyone, Victor, he said with a sigh. The man bowed and retired. Then he rose from the table, lit a cigarette, and flung himself down on a luxuriously cushioned couch that stood facing the screen. The screen was an old one, of gilt Spanish leather stamped and wrought with a rather florid Louis XIV pattern. He scanned it curiously, wondering, uh, wondering if ever before it had concealed the secret of a man's life. What? If you want attention, come sit in my lap. Come here. Don't just stare at the bed meowing. Come on. Sorry about this. Nope, nope, you're coming up. You're not going to keep puttering around down there. There we go. Now, stay here. Should he move it aside after all? Why not let it stay there? What was the use of knowing? If the thing was true, it was terrible. If it was not true, why trouble about it? But what if, by some fate or deadlier chance, eyes other than his spied behind and saw the horrible change. What should he do if Basil Hallward came and asked to look at his own picture? Basil would be sure to do that. No, the thing had to be examined and at once. Anything would be better than this dreadful state of doubt. He got up and locked both doors. At least he would be alone when he looked upon the mask of his shame. Then he drew the screen aside and saw himself face to face. It was perfectly true. The portrait had altered. As he often remembered afterwards, and always with no small wonder, he found himself at first gazing at the portrait with a feeling of almost scientific interest. That such a change should have taken place was incredible to him, and yet it was a fact. Was there some subtle affinity between the chemical atoms that changed themselves into form and color on the canvas and the soul that was within him? Could it be that what uh, could it be that what soul thought they realized that what it dreamed they made true, or was there some other more terrible reason? 
He shuddered and felt afraid, and going back to the couch lay there, gazing at the picture in sickened horror. One thing, however, he felt that it had done for him. It had made him conscious how unjust, how cruel he had been to Sybil Vane. It was not too late to remake reparations for that. She could still be his wife. His, unreason, uh, his unreal and selfish love would yield to some higher influence, would be transformed into some nobler passion, and the portrait that Basil Hallward had painted for him would be a guide to him through life, would be to him what holiness is to some, and conscious to others, and the fear of God to us all. There were opiates of remorse, drugs that could lull the mor moral sense to sleep. But here was a visible symbol of the degradation of sin. Here was an ever-present sign of the ruin men brought upon their souls. Three o'clock struck, and four, and the half-hour rang its double chime, but Dorian Gray did not stir. He was trying to gather up the scarlet threads of life, and to weave them into a pattern, to find his way through the sanguine labyrinth of passion through which he was wandering. He did not know what to do or what to think. Finally, he went over to the table and wrote a passionate letter to the girl he had loved, imploring her forgiveness and accusing himself of madness. He covered page after page with wild words of sorrow and wilder words of pain. There, was a, there is a luxury in self-reproach. When we blame ourselves, we feel that no one else has a right to blame us. It is the confession, not the priest, that gives us absolution. When Dorian had finished the letter, he felt that he had been forgiven. Suddenly there was a knock at the door, and he heard Lord Henry's voice outside. My dear boy, I must see you. Let me in at once. I can't bear your shutting yourself up like this. He made no answer at first, but remained quite still. The knocking still continued and grew louder. Yes, it was better to let Sir Lord Henry in, and to explain to him the new life he was going to lead, to quarrel with him if it became necessary to quarrel, to part if parting was inevitable. He jumped up, drew the screen hastily across the picture, and unlocked the door. I am so sorry for it all, Dorian, said Lord Henry as he entered, but you must not think too much of it. "'Do you mean about Sybil Vane?' asked the lad. "'Yes, of course,' answered Lord Henry, sinking into a chair and slowly pulling off his yellow gloves. "'It is dreadful from one point of view, but it was not your fault. Tell me, did you go behind and see her after the play was over?' "'Yes.' "'I felt sure you had. Did you make a scene with her?' "'I was brutal, Harry. Perfectly brutal. But it is all right now. I'm not Sorry, Sorry for, for anything, anything that, that has happened. happened. It has taught me to know myself better. Ah, Dorian, I am so glad you take it that way. I was afraid you would find I would find you plunged in remorse and tearing that nice curly hair of yours. I've got through that, said Dorian, shaking his head and smiling. I'm perfectly happy now. I know what conscience is, to begin with. It is not what you told me it was. It is the divinest thing in all in us. Don't sneer at it, Harry, and my any more. At least not before me. I want to be good. I want to bear the idea of my soul being hideous. A very charming artistic basis for ethics, Dorian. I congratulate you on it. But how are you going to begin? By marrying Sybil Vane. Marrying Sybil Vane cried Lord Henry, standing up and looking at it in a perplexed amazement. But, my dear Dory, yes, Harry, I know what you're going to say, something dreadful about marriage. Don't say it. Don't ever say things of that kind to me again. Two days ago, I asked Sybil to marry me. I'm going to break my word to her. Uh, I am not going to break my word to her. She is to be my wife. Your wife, Dory, and... Didn't you get my letter? I wrote to you this morning and sent the note down to, uh, down by my own man. The letter? Oh, yes, I remember. I have not read it yet, Harry. I was afraid there might be something in it that I wouldn't like. You cut life to pieces with your epigrams. You know nothing, then? What do you mean? 
Lord Henry walked across the room, and sitting down by Dorian Gray, took both his hands in his own, and held them tightly. Dorian, he said, my letter, don't be frightened, was to tell you that Sybil Vane is dead. A cry of pain broke from the lad's lips, and he leaped to his feet, tearing his hands away from Lord Henry's. Dead! Sybil's dead! It's not true. It is a horrible lie. How dare you say it? It is quite true, Dorian, said Lord Henry gravely. It is in all the morning papers. I wrote down to you to ask you not to see anyone until I come. There will have to be an inquest, of course, and you must not be mixed up in it. Things like that make a man fashionable in Paris. But in London, people are so prejudiced. Here, one should never make one's debut with a scandal. One should reserve that to give an interest to one's old age. I suppose they don't know your name at the theatre. If they don't, it is all right. Did anyone see you going around to her room? That is an important point. Dorian did not answer for a few moments. He was dazed with horror. Finally, he stammered in a stifled voice. Harry, did you say an inquest? What did you mean by that? Did Sybil... Oh, Henry, I can't bear it. But be quick. Tell me everything at once. I have no doubt it was not an accident, Dorian, though it must be put in that way to the public. It seems that, she, as she was leaving the theater with her mother, about half-past twelve or so, she said she had forgotten something upstairs. They waited some time for her, but she did not come down again. They ultimately found her lying dead on the floor of her own dressing room. She had swallowed something by mistake, some dreadful thing they use at theaters. I don't know what it was, but it had rather prusic acid, or either prusic acid or white lead in it. I should fancy it was prusic acid, as she seems to have died instantaneously. Harry, Harry, it's terrible, cried the lad. Yes, it is very tragic, of course, but you must not get yourself mixed up in it. I see by the standard that she was seventeen. I should have thought she was almost younger than that. She looked such a, t a child and seemed to know so little about acting. Dorian, you mustn't let this thing get on your nerves. You must come and dine with me, and afterwards we will look in at the opera. It is a patty night, and everybody will be there. You can come to my sister's box. She has got some smart women with her. So I have murdered Sybil Vane, said Dorian Gray half to himself. Murdered her as surely as if I had cut her little throat with a knife. Yet the roses are not less lovely for all that. The birds sing just as happily in my garden. And tonight I am dine, to dine with you, and then go to on to the opera, and sup somewhere. I suppose afterwards. How extraordinarily dramatic life is. If I had read all this in a book, Harry, I think I would have wept over it. Somehow, now that it has happened, actually, and, and to me, it seems far too wonderful for tears. Here is the first passionate love letter I have ever written in my life. Strange that my first passionate love letter should have been addressed to a dead girl. Can they feel, I wonder, those white, silent people we call the dead? Sybil. Can she feel or know or listen? Oh, Harry, how I loved her once. It seems years ago to me now. She was everything to me. Then came that dreadful night. Was it really only last night when she played so badly and my heart almost broke? She explained it all to me. It was terribly pathetic. But I was not moved a bit. I thought her shallow. Suddenly something happened that made me afraid. I can't tell you what it was, but it was terrible. I said I would go back to her. I felt I had done wrong. And now she's dead. My God. My God, Harry, what shall I do? You don't know the danger I am in, and there is nothing to keep me straight. She would have done that for me. She would have no right. She had no right to kill herself. It was selfish of her. 
My dear Dorian, answered Lord Henry, taking a cigarette from his case and producing a gold Latin, uh, yeah, Latin box. The only way a woman can ever reform a man is by boring him so completely that he loses all possible interest in life. If you had married this girl, you would have been wretched. Of course, you would have treated her kindly. One could always be kind to people about whom one cares nothing, but she would have soon found out that you were absolutely indifferent to her, and then a, and when a woman finds that out about her husband, she either becomes dreadfully dowdy or wears very smart bonnets that some other woman's husband has to pay for. I say nothing about the social mistake, which would have been abject, but of course I would not have allowed. But I assure you that in any, any case, the whole thing would have been an absolute failure. I suppose it would, muttered the lad, walking up and down the room and looking horribly pale. But I thought it was my duty. It was not my fault that this terrible tragedy has prevented my doing what was right. I remember your saying once that there is a fatality about good resolutions, that they are always made too late. Mine certainly were. Good resolutions are useless attempts to interfere with scientific laws. Their origin is pure vanity. Their result is absolutely nil. They give us, now and then, some of those luxurious sterile emotions that have a certain charm for the weak. That is all that can be said for them. They are simply checks that men draw on a bank where they have no account. Harry, cried Dorian Gray, coming over and sitting down beside him, why is it that I cannot feel this tragedy as much as I want to? I don't think I am heartless, do you? You have done too many foolish things during the last fortnight to be entitled to give yourself that name, Dorian, answered Lord Henry with his sweet melancholy smile. The lad frowned. I don't like that explanation, Harry, he rejoined. But I'm glad that you don't think I'm heartless. I'm nothing of the kind. I know I am not. And yet I must admit that this thing that has happened does not affect me as it should. It seems to me to be simply like a wonderful ending to a wonderful play. It has all the terrible beauty of a Greek tragedy, a tragedy in which I took a great part, but by which I have not been wounded. It is an interesting question, said Lord Henry, who found an exquisite pleasure in playing on the lad's unconscious egotism. An extremely interesting question. I fancy that the true explanation is this. It often happens that the real tragedies of life occur in such an, art, un, in such an inartistic manner that they hurt us by their crude violence, their absolute incoherence, their absurd want of meaning their entire lack of style. They affect us just as vulgarity affects us. They give us an impression of sheer brute force, and we revolt against that. Sometimes, however, a tragedy that possesses artistic elements of beauty crosses our lives. If these elements of beauty are real, the whole thing simply appeals to our sense of dramatic effect. Suddenly we find that we are no longer the actors, but the spectators of the play. Or rather, we are both. We watch ourselves, and the mere wonder of the spectacle enthralls us. In the present case, what is it that has really happened? Someone has killed herself for love of you. I wish that I had ever had such an experience. It would have made me in love with love for the rest of my life. The people who have adored me, there have not been very many, but there have been some, have always insisted on living on long after I have ceased to care for them, or are they to care for me. They have become stout and tedious, and when I met them, they go in at once for reminiscences. That awful memory of women. What a terrible thing it is, and what an utter intellectual stagnation it reveals. One should absorb the color of life, but one should never remember its details. Details are always vulgar. I must sow poppies in my garden, sighed Dorian. There is no necess necessity, rejoined his companion. 
Life has always poppies in her hands. Of course, now and then things linger. I wonder where... Uh, I wonder... Oh, sorry. I once wore nothing but violets all through one season as a form of artistic mourning for a romance that would not die. Ultimately, however, it did die. I forgot what killed it. I think it was her proposing to sacrifice the whole world for me. It is always a dreadful moment. It fills one with a terror of eternity. Well, would you believe it? A week ago, at Lady Hampshire's, I found myself seated at dinner next to the lady in question, and she insisted in going over the whole thing again and digging up the past and raking up the future. I had buried any ro uh, I had buried my romance in a bed of asphodel. She dragged it out again and assured me that I had spoiled her life. I am bound to state that she ate an enormous dinner, so I did not feel any anxiety. But what a lack of taste it showed. The one charm of the past is that it is the past. But women never know when the curtain has fallen. They always want a sixth act. And as soon as the interest of the play is entirely over, they propose to continue it. If they were allowed their own way, every comedy would have a tragic ending, and every tragedy would culminate in a farce. They are charmingly artificial, but they have no sense of art. You are more fortunate than I, I assure you, Dorian, that not one of the women I have known would have done for me what Sybil Vane did for you. Ordinary women always console themselves. Some of them do it by going in for sentimental colors. Never trust a woman who wears mauve, whatever her age may be, or a woman over thirty-five who is fond of pink ribbons. It always means that they have a history. Others find a great consolation in suddenly discovering the good qualities of their husbands. They flaunt their conjugal felicity in one's face as if it were the most fascinating of sins. Religion consoles some. Its mysteries have all the charm of a flirtation, a woman once more told me, and I can quite understand. Besides, nothing makes one so vain as being told that one is a sinner. Conscience makes egotists of us all. Yes, there is really no end to the consolations that women find in modern life. Indeed, I have not mentioned the most important one. What is that, Harry? said the lad listlessly. Oh, the obvious consolation, taking someone else's admirer when lo one loses one's own. In good society, that always whitewashes a woman. But really, Dorian, how different Sybil Vane must have been from all the women one meets. There is something to me quite beautiful about her death. I am glad I am living in a century when such wonders happen. They make one believe in the reality of things we all play with, such as romance, passion, and love. It was terribly cruel to her. You forget that. I am afraid that women appreciate cruelty, downright cruelty, more than anything else. They have wonderfully primitive instincts. We have emancipated them, but they remain slaves looking for their masters all the same. They love being dominated. I am sure you are splendid. I have never seen you really and absolutely angry, but I can fancy how delightful you looked. And after all, you said something to me the day before yesterday that seemed to be merely fanciful, but that I see now was absolutely true, and it holds the key to everything. You just kind of, oh, not kind of, you just really want to punch Lord Henry. What is that, Henry? You said to me that Sybil Vane represented to you all the heroines of romance, that she was Desdemona one night and Ophelia the other, that if she died as Juliet, she came to life as Imogen. She will never come back to life again now, muttered the lad, burying his face in his hands. No, she never will come to life. She has played her last part, but you must think of that lonely death in the tawdry dressing room, simply as a strange lurid fragment from some Jacobian tragedy, as a wonderful scene from Webster, or Ford, or Sibyl, uh, Cyril Tourneur. The girl never really lived, and so she has never really died. 
To you, at least, she was always a dream, a phantom that flitted through Shakespeare's plays and left them lovelier for its presence, a reed through which Shakespeare's music sounded richer and more full of life. The moment she touched actual life, she marred it, and it marred her, and so she passed away. Mourn for Ophelia, if you like. Put ashes on your head, because Cordelia was strangled. Cry out against heaven, because the daughter of Brabantino died. But don't waste your tears over Sybil Vane. She was less real than they are. There was a silence. The evening darkened in the room. Noiselessly, with silver feet, the shadows crept in from the garden. The colors faded wearily out of things. After some time, Dorian Gray looked up. You have explained me to myself, Harry, he murmured with something of a sigh of relief. I felt all that you have said, but somehow I was afraid of it, and I could not express it to myself. How well you know me. But we will not talk again of what has happened. It has been a marvelous experience. That is all. I wonder if life is still in store for me anything as marvelous. Life has everything in store for you, Dorian. There is nothing that you, with your extraordinary good taste, uh, good looks, will not be able to do. But suppose, Harry, I became haggard and old and wrinkled. What then? Ah, oh, Dorian, said Lord Henry, rising to go, then, my dear Dorian, you would have to fight for your victories. As it is, they are brought to you. No, you must keep your good looks. We live in an age that reads too much to be wise, and that thinks too much to be beautiful. We cannot spare you. And now you had better dress and drive down to the cab. We are rather late as it is. I think I shall join you at the opera, Harry. I've feel too tired to eat anything. What is the number of your sister's box? Twenty-seven, I believe. It is on the grand tier. You will see her name on the door, but I am sorry you won't come and dine. I don't feel up to it, said Dorian listlessly. But I am awfully obliged to you for all that you have said to me. You are certainly my best friend. No one has ever understood me as you have. "'We are only at the beginning of our friendship, Dorian,' answered Lord Henry, shaking him by the hand. "'Good-bye. I shall see you before nine-thirty, I, I hope. Remember, Patty is singing.' As he closed the door behind him, Dorian Gray touched the bell, and in a few minutes Victor appeared with the lamps and drew the blinds down. He waited impatiently for him to go. The man seemed to take an interminable amount of time over everything.' As soon as he had left, he rushed to the screen and drew it back. No, there was no further change in the picture. It had received the news of Sybil Vane's death before he had known of it himself. It was conscious of the events of life as they occurred. The vicious cruelty that marred the fa fine lines of the mouth had no doubt appeared at the very moment that the girl had drunk the poison, whatever it was. Or was it indifferent? two results. Did it merely take cognizance of what passed within the soul? He wondered and hoped that some day he would see the change taking place before his very eyes shuddered as he hoped it. Poor Sybil! What a romance it had all been! She had often mimicked death on the stage. Then death himself had touched her and taken her with him. How had she played that dreadful last scene? Had she cursed him as she died? No, she had died for love of him, and love would always be a sacrament to him now. She had atoned for everything by the sacrifice she had made of her life. He would not think any more of what she had made him go through on that horrible night at the theater. When he thought of her, it would be as a wonderful, tragic figure sent on to the world stage to show the supreme reality of love. A wonderful tragic figure. Tears came to his eyes as he remembered her childlike look and winsome fanciful ways and shy tremulous grace. He brushed them away hastily and looked at the picture. 
He felt that the time had come, uh, really come for making his choice, or had his choice already been made. Yes, life had decided that for him, life and his own infinite curiosity about life, eternal youth, infinite passion, pleasures, subtle and secret, wild joys and wilder sins. He was to have all these things. The portrait was to bear the burden of his shame, that was all. A feeling of pain crept over him as he thought of the desecration of what uh, that was in store for the fair, uh, fair face on the canvas. Once, in boyish mockery of Narcissus, he had kissed, or feigned to kiss, those painted lips that now smiled so cruelly at him. Morning after morning he had sat before the portrait, wondering at its beauty, almost enamored of it, as it seemed to him at times. Was it to alter now with every mood to which he yielded? Was it to become a monstrous and loathsome thing, to be hidden away in a locked room, to be shut out from the sunlight that he had so often touched to brighter gold the waving wonder of his hair? The pity of it all, the pity of it! For a moment he thought of praying that the horrible sympathy that existed between him and the picture might cease. It had changed in answer to a prayer, perhaps in answer to a prayer it might remain unchanged. And yet, who that knew anything about life would surrender the chance of remaining always young, however fantastic that change may be, or with what fateful consequences it might be fraught? Besides, was it really under his control? Had it indeed been prayer that had produced the substitution? Might there not be some curious scientific reason for it all? It, if thought could exercise its influence upon a living organism, might not thought exercise an influence upon dead and inorganic things? Nay, without thought of or conscious desire, might not things external to one's, uh, ourselves vibrate in unison with our moods and passions, atoms calling to atom? in secret love or a strange affinity. But the reason was of no importance. He would never again attempt, uh, never again tempt by a prayer any terrible power. If the picture was to alter, it was to alter. That was all. Why inquire too closely into it? For there would be a real pleasure in watching it. He would be able to follow his mind into its secret places. This portrait would be to him the most magical of mirrors, as it had revealed to him his own body, so it would reveal to him his own soul. And when winter came upon it, he would still be standing where spring trembles on the verge of summer. When the blood crept from its face, and left behind a pallid mask of chalk with leaden eyes, he would keep the glamour of boyhood. Not one of his life would ever weak. Uh, oh, not one blossom of his loveliness would ever fade. Not one pulse of his life would ever weaken. Like the gods of the Greeks, he would be strong and fleet and joyous. What did it matter what happened to the colored image on the canvas? He would be safe. That was everything. He drew the screen back into its former place in front of the picture, smiling as he did so, and passed into his bedroom where his valet was already waiting for him. An hour later, he was at the opera and Lord Henry was leaning over his chair. Chapter 9 as he was sitting at breakfast next morning, Basil Hallward was shown into the room. "'I'm so glad I have found you, Dorian,' she said gravely. "'I called last night, but they told me that you were at the opera. "'Of course, I knew that was impossible, but I wish you had left word where you had really gone to. "'I passed a dreadful evening, half afraid that one tragedy might be followed by another. "'I think you might have telegraphed me when you heard of it first. I read of it quite by chance in the late edition of the Globe that I picked up at the club. I came here at once and was miserable at not finding you. 
I can't tell you how heartbroken I am about the whole thing. I know that you must suffer. But where were you? Did you go down and see the girl's mother? For a moment I thought of following you there. They gave me the, the address in the paper. Somewhere in the Euston Road, isn't it? But I was afraid of intruding upon a sorrow that I could not lighten. Poor woman! What a state she must be in! And her only child, too. What did she say about it all? My dear Basil, how, did you know, how do I know? murmured Dorian Gray, sipping some pale yellow wine from a delicate gold-beaded bubble of Venetian glass, and looking dreadfully bored. I was at the opera. You should have come on there. I met Lady Gwendolen, Harry's sister, for the first time. We were in her box. She's perfectly charming, and Patty sang divinely. Don't talk about horrid subjects. If one doesn't talk about a thing, it has never happened. It's simply an ex uh, it is simply expression, as Harry says, that gives reality to things. I may mention that she was not the woman's only child. There is a son, a charming fellow, I believe, but he is not on the stage. He is a sailor or something. And now, tell me about yourself and what you are painting. You went to the opera, said Hallward, speaking very slowly and with a, stain, a strained touch of pain in his voice. You went to the opera while Sibyl Vane was lying dead in some sordid lodging? You can talk to me of other women being charming, and of Patty singing divinely before the girl you loved was ever the quiet of a grave to sleep in? Why, man, there are horrors in store for that little white body of hers. Stop, Basil, I won't hear it, cried Dorian, leaping to his feet. You must not tell me about things. What is done is done. What is past is past. You call yesterday the past? It was the actual lapse of... What was the actual lapse of time got to do with it? It is only shallow people who require years to get rid of an emotion. A man who is master of himself can end a sorrow as easily as he can invent a pleasure. I don't want to be at the mercy of my emotions. I want to use them, to enjoy them, and to dominate them. Dorian, that's horrible. Something has changed you completely. You look exactly the same wonderful boy who day after day used to come down to my studio to sit from his picture. But you were simple, natural, and affectionate then. You were the most unspoiled creature in the whole world. Now I don't know what has come over you. You talk as if you had no heart, no pity in you. It is all Harry's influence, I see that. The lad flushed up and, going to the window, looked out for a few moments on the green, flickering, sun-lashed garden. I owe a great deal to Harry Basil, he said at last. More than I owe to you. You only taught me to be vain. Well, I am punished for that, Dorian, or shall be some day. I don't know what you mean, Basil, he exclaimed, turning round. I don't know what you want. What do you want? I want the Dorian Gray I used to paint, said the artistic uh, artist sadly. Basil, said the lad, going over to him and putting his hand on his shoulder, his shoulder. You have come too late. Yesterday, when I heard that Sybil Vane had killed herself. Killed herself? Good heavens! Is there no doubt about that? cried Hallward, looking up at him with an expression of horror. My dear Basil, surely you don't think it was a vulgar accident. Of course she killed herself. The elder man buried his face in his hands. How fearful, he murmured, and a shudder ran through him. No, said Dorian Gray, there is nothing fearful about it. It was one of the great romantic tragedies of the age. As a rule, people who act lead the most commonplace lives. There are good hus uh, they are good husbands or faithful wives or sometimes uh, something tedious. You know what I mean, middle-class virtue and all that kind of thing. How different Sybil was. She lived her finest tragedy. She was always a heroine. The last night she played, the night you saw her, she acted badly because she had known the reality of love. When she knew its unreality, she died as Juliet might have died. 
she passed again into the sphere of art. There is something of the martyr about her. Her death has all the pathetic uselessness of martyrdom, all its wasted beauty. As, uh, but, as I was saying, you must not think I have not suffered. If you had come in yesterday at, the partic at a particular moment, about half past five, perhaps a quarter to six, you would have found me in tears. Even Harry, who was here, who brought me the news, in fact, had no idea what I was going through. I suffered immensely. Then it passed away. I cannot repeat an emotion. No one can except sentimentalists. And you are awfully unjust, Basil. You come down here to console me. That is charming of you. You find me consoled and you are furious. How like a sympathetic person. You remind me of a story Harry told me about a certain philanthropist who spent twenty years of his life in trying to get some grievance re uh, redressed or some unjust law altered. Forget exactly what it was. Finally, he uh, succeeded and nothing could exceed his disappointment. He had absolutely nothing to do, almost died of ennui, and became a confirmed misanthrope. Uh, misanthrop. Besides, my dear old Basil, if you really want to console me, teach me rather to forget what has happened, or to see it from a proper artistic point of view. Was it not Gautier who used to write about La Consolation des Arts? I remember picking up a little vellum-covered book in your studio one day and chancing on that delightful phrase. Well, I am not like that young man you told me of when we were down at the Marlowe together, the young man who used to say that yellow satin could console one for all the miseries of life. I love beautiful things that one can touch and handle. Old brocade, green bronzes, lacquer work, carved ivories, exquisite surroundings, luxury, pomp. There is much to be got from all these things, but the artistic temperament that you they create or at any rate reveal, still more to me, to become the spectator of one's own life, as Harry says, is to escape the suffering of life. I know you are surprised at my talking to you like this. You have not realized how I have developed. I was a schoolboy when you knew me. I am a man now. I have new passions, new thoughts, new ideas. I am different, but you must not li uh, like me less. I am changed, but you must always be my friend. Of course, I am very fond of Harry, but I know that you are better than he is. You are not stronger, you are too much afraid of life, but you are better. And how happy we used to be together. Don't leave me, Basil, and don't quarrel with me. I am what I am. There is nothing more to be said. The painter felt strangely moved. The lad was infinitely dear to him, and his personality had been the great turning point in his art. He could not bear the idea of reproaching him any more. After all, his indifference was probably merely a mood that would pass away. There was so much in him that was good, so much in him that was noble. "'Well, Dorian,' he said at length with a sad smile, I won't speak to you again about this horrible thing after today. I only trust your name won't be mentioned in connection with it. You, The inquest is to take place this afternoon. Have they summoned you? Dorian shook his head, and a look of annoyance passed over his face at the mention of the word inquest. There was something so crude and vulgar about everything of the kind. They don't know my name, he answered. But surely she did. Only my Christian name, and that I am quite sure she never mentioned to anyone. She told me once that they were all rather curious to learn who I was, and that she invariably told them my name was Prince Charming. It was pretty of her. You must do me a drawing of Sybil, Basil. I should like to have something more of her than the memory of a few kisses and some broken, pathetic words. I will try to do something, Dorian, if it would please you. But you must come and sit to me yourself again. I can't get on without you. 
I can never sit to you again, Basil. It is impossible, he exclaimed, starting again. The painter stared at him. My dear boy, what nonsense, he cried. Do you mean to say that you don't like what I did for you? Where is it? Why have you pulled the screen in front of it? Let me look at it. It is the best thing I have ever done. Do take the screen away, Dorian. It is simply disgraceful of your servant hiding my work like that. I felt the world, uh, the room looked different as I came in. My servant has nothing to do with it, Basil. You don't imagine I let him arrange my room for me. He settles my flowers for me sometimes. That is all. No, I did it myself. The light was too strong on the portrait. Too strong? Surely not, my dear fellow. It is an admirable place for it. Let me see it. And Hallward rocked toward the corner of the room. A cry of terror broke from Dorian Gray's lips, and he rushed between the painter and the screen. Basil, he said, looking very pale, you must not look at it. I don't wish you to. Not look at my own work? You are not serious. Why shouldn't I look at it? exclaimed Hallward, laughing. You, if you try to look at it, Basil, on my word of honor, I will never speak to you again as long as I live. I'm quite serious. I don't offer any explanation, and you are not to ask for any, but remember, if you touch the screen, everything is over between us. Hallward was thunderstruck. He looked at Dorian Gray in absolute amazement. He had never seen him like this before. The lad was actually pallid with rage. His hands were clenched, and the pupils of his eyes were like discs of blue fire. He was trembling all over. Dorian, don't speak! But what is the matter? Of course I won't look at it if you don't want me to, he said rather coldly, turning on his heel and going over toward the window. But, uh, but really, it seems rather absurd that I shouldn't see my own work, especially as I am about to exhibit it in Paris in the autumn. I shall probably have to give it another coat of varnish before that, so I must see it some day. And why not today? To exhibit it? You want to exhibit it? exclaimed Dorian Gray, a, sense, a strange sense of terror creeping over him. Was the world going to be shown his secret? Were people to gape at the mystery of his life? That was impossible. Something he did not know what had to be done, and once... Yes, I don't suppose you will object to that. Georges Petit is going to collect all of my best pictures for a special exhibition in the Rue de Sèze, which will open the first week in October. The portrait will only be away a month. I should think you could easily spare it for that time. In fact, you are sure to be cut out, uh, be out of town, and if you keep it always behind a screen, you can't care too much about it. Dorian Gray passed his hand over his forehead. There were beads of perspiration here. He felt that he was on the brink of a horrible danger. You told me a month ago that you would never exhibit it, he cried. Why have you changed your mind? You people who go in for being consistent have just as many moods as other pe uh, others, sorry, just as many moods as other have. The only difference is that your moods are rather meaningless. You can't have forgotten that you assured me most solemnly that nothing in the world would induce you to send it to any exhibition. You told Harry the exact same thing. He stopped suddenly, and a gleam of light came into his eyes. He remembered that Lord Henry had said to him once, half seriously and half in jest, If you want to have a strange quarter of an hour, get Basil to tell you why he won't exhibit your picture. He told me why he wouldn't, and it was a revelation to me. Yes, perhaps Basil, too, had his secrets. He would ask him and try. Basil, he said, coming over quite close and looking him straight in the face, we have each of us a secret. Let me know yours, and I shall tell you mine. What was your reason for refusing to exhibit my picture? The painter shuddered in spite of himself. Dorian, if I told you, you might like me less than you do, and you would certainly laugh at me. I could not bear your doing either of those things. If you wish me never to look at your portrait and picture again, I am content. 
I have always you to look at. If you wish the best work I have ever done to be hidden from the world, I am satisfied. Your friendship is dear to me, a dearer to me than any fame or reputation. No, Basil, you must tell me, insisted Dorian Gray. I think I have a right to know. His feeling of terror had passed away, and curiosity had taken its place. He was determined to find out Basil Hallward's mystery. Let us sit down, Dorian, said the painter, looking troubled. Let us sit down, and just answer me one question. Have you noticed in the picture something curious? Something that probably at first did not strike you, but that revealed itself to you suddenly? Basil! cried the lad, clutching his arms of his chair with trembling hands and gazing at him with wild, startled eyes. I see you did. Don't speak. Wait till you hear what I have to say. Dorian, from the moment I met you, your personality had the most extraordinary influence over me. I was dominated, soul, brain, and power, by you. You became, to me, the visible incarnation of that unseen ideal whose memory haunts us artists like an exquisite dream. I worshipped you. I grew jealous of everyone to whom you spoke. I wanted to have you all to myself. I was only happy when I was with you. When you were away from me, you were still present in my art. Of course, I never let you know anything about this. It would have been impossible. You would not have understood it. I hardly understood it myself. I only knew that I had seen perfection face to face, and that the world had become wonderful to my eyes. Too wonderful, perhaps, for in such mad worships there is a peril, the peril of losing them, no less than the peril of keeping them. Weeks and weeks went on, and I grew more and more absorbed in you. Then came a new development. I have drawn you, I had drawn you as Paris in dainty armour, and as Adonis with huntsman's cloak and polished boar's spear. Crowned with heavy lotus blossoms, you had sat on the, crown, uh, on the prow of Adrian's barge, gazing across the green turban, uh, turbid Nile. You had leaned over the still pool of some Greek woodland and saw in the water's silent silver the marvel of your own face, and it had all been what art should be, unconscious, ideal, and remote. One day, a fateful day, I sometimes think, I determined to paint a wonderful portrait of you as you actually are, not in the costume of dead ages, but in your own dress and in your own time. Whether it was the realism of the method, or the mere wonder of your own personality, thus directly presented to me without mist of e or veil, I cannot tell. But I know that as I worked at it, every flake and film of color seemed to me to reveal my secret. I grew afraid that others would know of my idolatry. I felt, Dorian, that I had told too much, that I had put too much of myself into it. Then it was that I resolved never to allow the picture to be exhibited. You were a little annoyed, but then you did not realize all that it meant to me. Harry, to whom I talked about, uh, to whom I talked about it, laughed at me, but I did not mind that. When the picture was finished and I had sat alone with it, I felt that I was right. Well, after a few days, the thing left my studio, and as soon as I had got rid of the intolerable fascination of its presence, it seemed to me that I had been foolish in imagining that I had seen anything at all, more than that you were extremely good-looking and that I could paint. Even now I cannot help feeling that it is a mistake to think that the passion one feels in creation is ever really shown in the work one creates. Art is always more abstract than we fancy. Form and color tell us of form and color. That is all. It often seems to me that art conceals the artist far more completely than it ever reveals him. And so, when I got this offer from Paris, I determined to make your portrait the principal thing in my exhibition. It never occurred to me that you would refuse. I see now that you are right. The picture cannot be shown. You must not be angry with me, Dorian, for what I have told you. As I did to Harry once, you are made to be worshipped. 
Oh, as I said to be Harry, uh, to Harry once. Dorian Gray drew a long breath. The color came back to his cheeks, and a smile played about his lips. The peril was over. He was safe for the time, yet he could not help feeling intimate pity for the painter who had just made this strange confession to him, and wondered if he himself would ever be so dominated by the personality of a friend. Lord Henry had the charm of being very dangerous, but that was all. He was too clever and too cynical to be really fond of. Would there ever be someone who would fill him with a strange idolatry? Was that one of the things that life had in store? It is extraordinary to me, Dorian, said Hallward, that you should have seen this in the portrait. Did you really see it? I saw something in it, he answered. Something that seemed to me very curious. Well, you don't mind my looking at the thing now. Dorian shook his head. You must not ask me that, Basil. I could not possibly let you stand in front of that picture. You will some day, surely. Never. Well, perhaps you were right. Now, goodbye, Dorian. You have been the one person in my life who has really influenced my art. Whatever I have done that is good, I owe to you. Oh, you don't know what it cost me to tell you all that I have told you. My dear Basil, said Dorian, what have you told me? Simply that you felt that you admired me too much. That is not even a compliment. It was not intended as a compliment. It was a confession. Now that I have made it, something seems to have gone out of me. Perhaps when should never put one's worship into words. It was a very disappointing confession. Why, what did you expect, Dorian? You didn't see anything else in the picture, did you? There was nothing else to see. No, there was nothing else to see. Why do you ask? But you mustn't talk about worship. It is foolish. You and I are friends, Basil, and we will always remain so. You have got Harry said the painter sadly. Oh, Harry, cried the lad with a ripple of laughter. Harry spends his days in saying what is incredible, and his evenings in doing what is improbable, just the sort of life I would like to lead. But still, I don't think I would go to Harry if I were in trouble. I would sooner go to you, Basil. You will sit to me again. Impossible. Oh, you spoil my life as an artist by refusing, Dorian. No man comes across two ideal things. Few come across one. I can't explain it to you, Basil, but I must never sit to you again. There is something fatal about a portrait. It has a life of its own. I will come and have tea with you. That will be just as pleasant. Pleasanter for you, I am afraid, murmured Hallward regretfully. And now goodbye. I'm sorry you won't let me look at the portrait once again. But that can't be helped. I quite understand that what you feel about it. As he left the room, Dorian Gray smiled to himself. Poor Basil. How little he knew of the true reason, and how strange it was that, instead of having been forced to reveal his own secret, he had succeeded, almost by chance, in wresting a secret from his friend. How much... That uh, how much that strange confession explained to him. The painter's absurd fits of jealousy, his wild devotion, his extravagant panegyrics, his curious reticences. He understood them all now, and he felt sorry. There seemed to him to be something tragic in a friendship so colored by romance. He sighed and touched the bell. The portrait must be hidden away at all costs. He could not run risk, uh, run such a risk of discovering again. It had been mad of him to have allowed the thing to remain, even for an hour in a room to which any of his friends had access. Chapter 10 When his servant entered, he looked at him steadfastly. 
and wondered if he had thought of peering behind the screen. The man was quite impassive and waited for his orders. Dorian lit a cigarette and walked over to the glass and glanced into it. He could see all the reflection of Victor's face perfectly. It was like a placid mask of civ servility. There was nothing to be afraid of there. Yet he thought it best to be on his guard. Speaking very slowly, he told him to tell the housekeeper that he wanted to see her, and then to go to the frame-maker and ask him to send two of his men round at once. It seemed to him that as the man left the room, his eyes wandered in the direction of the screen. Or was that merely his own fancy? After a few moments, in their black silk dress with odd-fashioned thread mittens on her wrinkled hands, Mrs. Leaf bustled into the library. He asked her for the key of the schoolroom. "'The old schoolroom, uh, school Mr. Dorian?' she exclaimed. "'Why, it is full of dust. I must get it arranged and put straight back before you go into it. It's not fit for you to see, sir. It is not, indeed.' I don't want it put straight, Leaf. I only want the key. Well, sir, you'll be covered with cobwebs if you go into it. Why, it hasn't been opened for nearly five years, not since his lordship died. He winced at the mention of his grandfather. He had hateful memories of him. That does not matter, he answered. I simply want to see the place, that is all. Give me the key. "'And here's the key, sir,' said the old lady, going over the contents of her bunch with tremulous, uncertain hands. "'Here is the key. I'll have it off the bunch in a moment. But you don't think of living up there, sir, and you so comfortable here.' "'No, no,' he cried petulously. "'Thank you, Leaf. That will do.' She lingered for a few moments, and was garrulous over some detail of the housework, household. He sighed and told her to manage things as she thought best. She left the room, wretched in smile. Uh, oh, sorry, wreathed in smiles. As the door closed, Dorian put the key in his pocket and looked about the room. His eyes fell on a large purple satin coverlet, heavily embroidered with a gold and splendid piece of late seventeenth-century Venetian work that his grandfather had found in a convent near Bologna. Yes, that would serve to wrap the dreadful thing in. It had perhaps served often as a pall for the dead. Now it was to hide something that had a corruption of its own, worse than the corruption of death itself, something that would breed horrors and yet would never die. What the worm was to the corpse, his sins would be to the painted image of the canvas. They would mar its beauty and eat away its grace, they would defile it and make it shameful, and yet the thing would still live on. It would be always alive. He shuddered, and for a moment he regretted that he had not told Basil the true reason why he had wished to hide the picture away. Basil would have helped him to resist Lord Henry's influence, and the still more poisonous influences that came from his own temperament. The love that he bore him, for it was really love, had nothing in it that was not noble and intellectual. It was not the mere physical admiration of beauty that is born of the senses and that dies when the senses tire. It was such love as Michelangelo had known, and Mont uh, Montaigne, and Wickelman, and Shakespeare himself. Yes, Basil uh, could have saved him, but it was too late now. The past could always be annihilated. Regret, denial, or forgiveness Getness could do that. But the future was inevitable. There were passions in him that would find their terrible outlet, dreams that would make the shadow of their evil, their evil real. He took up from the couch the great purple and gold texture that covers it, and holding it in his hands, passed between uh, behind the canvas. Was the face of the canvas violent than before? It seemed to him it was unchanged, and yet his loathing of it was intensified. Gold hair, blue eyes, and rose-red lips, they were all there. It was simply the expression that had altered. That was, hor uh, yeah, that was horrible in its cruelty, compared to what he saw in it of 
uh, censure and, or rebuke, how shallow Basil's reproaches about Sybil Vane had been, how shallow and of what little account. His own soul was looking out at him from the canvas and calling him to judgment. A look of pain came over him, and he flung the rich pall over the picture. As he did so, a knock came to the door. He passed out as his servant entered. The persons are here, monsieur. He felt that the man must got, be got rid of at once. He must not be allowed to know where the picture was being taken up to. There was something sly about him, and he had thoughtful, treacherous eyes. Sitting down at the writing table, he scribbled a note to Sir Henry, asking him to send him something to read and reminding him that they were to meet at 8.15 that evening. "'Wait for an answer,' he said, handing it to him, "'and show the men in here.' In two or three minutes there was another knock, and Mr. Hubbard himself, the celebrated frame-maker of South Audley Street, came in with a somewhat rogue-looking young assistant. Mr. Hubbard was a florid, red-whiskered little man, whose administration for art was considerably tempered by the inveter uh, inveterate <laughs> impecuniosity of most of the artists who dealt with him. As a rule, he never let his, left his shop. He waited for people to come to him, but he always made an exception in favor of Dorian Gray. There was something about Dorian that charmed everybody. It was a pleasure even to see him. "'What can I do for you, Mr. Gray?' he said, rubbing his fat, freckled hands. "'I thought I would do myself the honor of coming round in person. "'I have just got a beauty of a frame, sir, picked it up at a sale. "'Old Florentine, come from Fontil, I believe. "'Admirably suited for a religious subject, Mr. Gray. "'I am so sorry you have given yourself the trouble of coming round, Mr. Hubbard. "'I, I shall certainly drop in and look at the frame.' Though I don't go in much at the present for religious art, but today I only want a picture carried to the top of the house for me. It is rather heavy, so I thought I would ask you to lend me a couple of your men. No trouble at all, Mr. Gray. I'm delighted to see any be of any service to you. Which is the work of art, sir? This, replied Dorian, moving the screen back. Can you move it? covering and all just as it is. I don't want it to get scratched going upstairs. <clears throat> there will be no difficulty, sir, said the genial frame maker, beginning, with the aid of his assistant, to unhook the picture from the long brass chains by which it was suspended. And now, where shall we carry it to, Mr. Gray? I will show you the way, Mr. Hubbard, if you will kindly follow me. Or perhaps you had better go in front. I am afraid it is right at the top of the house. We will go up by the front staircase, as it is wider. He held the door open for them, and they passed out into the hall and began the ascent. The elaborate character of the frame had made the picture extremely bulky, and now and then, in spite of the obsequious protests of Mr. Hubbard, who had the true tradesman's spirited dislike of seeing a gentleman doing anything useful, Dorian put his hand to it so as to help him. "'Something of a load to carry, sir,' gasped the little man when they reached the top landing, and he wiped his shiny forehead. "'I am afraid it is rather heavy,' murmured Dorian as he unlocked the door that opened into the room that was to keep for him the curious secret of his life and hide his soul from the eyes of men. He had not entered the place for more than four years, not indeed since he had used it first as a playroom when he was a child, and then as a study when he grew somewhat older. It was a large, well-proportioned room, which had been especially built by the last Lord Kelso for the use of the little grandson whom, for his strange likeness to his mother, and also for other reasons, he had always hated and desired to keep at a distance. It appeared to Dorian to have been to have but little changed. There was the huge Italian cassonet, with its fantastically painted panels and its tarnished gilt mouldings, in which he had so often hidden himself as a boy. There was the satin wood bookcase filled with his dog-eared book, uh, school books, 
On the wall behind it was hanging the same ragged Flemish tapestry where a faded king and queen were playing chess in a garden, while a company of hawkers rode by carrying hooded birds on their gauntleted wrists. How well he remembered it all. Every moment of his lonely childhood came back to him as he looked round. He recalled the stainless purity of his boyish life, and it seemed horrible to him that it was here the fatal portrait was to be hidden away. How little he had thought in those dead days of all that was in store for him. But there was no other place in the house so secure from prying eyes as this. He had the key, and no one else could enter it. Beneath its purple pall, the face painted on the canvas would grow bestial, sodden, and unclean. What did it matter? No one could see it. He himself would not see it. Why should he watch the uh, hideous corruption of his soul? He kept his youth, that was enough. And besides, might not his nature grow finer, after all? There was no reason that the future should be so full of shame. Some love might come across his life and purify him and shield him from those sins that seemed to be already stirring in, spite, uh, in spirit and in flesh. Those curious, unpictured sins whose very mystery lent them their subtlety and their charm. Perhaps some day the cruel look would have passed away from the scarlet, sensitive mouth, and he might show to the world Basil Hallward's masterpiece. Now that was impossible. Hour by hour and week by week, the thing upon the canvas was growing old. It might escape the hideousness of sin, but the hideousness of age was in store for it. The cheeks would become hollow or flaccid, yellows cro uh, yellow crow feet, crow's feet, sorry, would creep round the fading eyes and make them horrible. The hair would lose its brightness, the mouth would gape or droop, would be foolish or gross, as the mouths of old men are. There would be the wrinkled throat, the cold blue-veined heads, the hands, the twisted body that he remembered in his grandfather who had been so stern to him in his boyhood. The picture had to be concealed. There was no help for it. Bring it in, Mr. Hubbard, please, he said wearily, turning around. I am sorry I kept you so long. I was thinking of something else. Always glad to have a rest, Mr. Gray, answered the frame maker, who was still gasping for breath. Where shall we put it, sir? Oh, anywhere. Here. This will do. I don't want to have it hung up. Just lean it against the wall. Thanks. Might one look at the work of art, sir? Dorian started. Uh, it would not interest you, Mr. Hubbard, he said, keeping his eyes on the man. He felt ready to leap upon him and fling him to the ground if he dared to lift the gorgeous hanging that concealed the secret of his life. I shan't trouble you any more now. I am much obliged for your kindness in coming round. Not at all, not at all, Mr. Gray. Everybody to do anything for you, sir. And Mr. Hubbard tramped downstairs, followed by the assistant, who glanced back at Dorian with a look of shy wonder in his rough, uncomely face. He had never seen anyone so marvelous. When the sound of their footsteps had died away, Dorian locked the door and put the key in his pocket. He felt safe now. No one would ever look upon the horrible thing. No eye but his would ever see his shame. On reaching the library, he found that it was just after five o'clock and that the tea had been already brought up. On a little table of dark perfumed wood, thickly encrusted with nacre, a nacre, a present from Lady Radley, his guardian's wife, a pretty unprofessional, uh, a pretty professional invalid, who had spent the preceding winter in Cairo, was lying a note from Lord Henry, and beside it was a book bound in yellow paper, the cover slightly torn and the edges soiled, a copy of the third edition of the Saint James Gazette. He had been. Uh, had been placed on the tea tray. It was evident that Victor had returned. He wondered if he had met the men in the hall as they were leaving the house, and had wormed out of them that they what they had been doing. 
he would be sure to miss the picture. Had no doubt missed it already while he had been lying the tea things. The screen had not been set back, and a blank space was visible on the wall. Perhaps some night he might find him creeping up the stairs and trying to force the door of the room. It was a horrible thing to have a spy in one's house. He had heard of rich men who had been blackmailed all their lives by some servant who had read a letter or overheard a conversation. <clears throat> or picked up a card with an address, or found beneath a pillow a withered flower or shred of crumpled lace. He sighed, and having poured himself out some tea, opened Lord Henry's note. It was simply to say that he sent him round the evening paper, and a book that might interest him, and that he would be at the club at 8.15. He opened the St. James languidly, and looked through it, a red pencil mark on the fifth page, caught his eye. It drew attention to the following paragraph. Inquest on an actress. An inquest was held this morning at the Bell Tavern, Hoxton Road, by Mr. Danby, the district coroner, on the body of Sybil Vane, a young actress recently engaged at the Royal Theatre, Holborn. A verdict of death by misadventure was returned. Considerable sympathy was expressed for the mother of the deceased, who was greatly affected during the giving of her own evidence, and that of Mr. Birrell, who had made the post-mortem examination of the deceased. He frowned, and tearing the paper in two, went across the room and flung the piece away. How ugly it all was! And how horribly real ug uh, ugliness made things! He felt a little annoyed with Lord Henry, uh, Henry for having sent him the report and it was certainly stupid of him to have marked it with red pencil. Victor might have read it. The man knew more than enough English for that. Perhaps he had read it and, be, and had begun to suspect something. And yet what did it matter? What had Dorian Gray to do with Sybil Vane's death? There was nothing of to fear. Dorian Gray had not killed her. His eyes fell on the yellow book that Lord Henry had sent him. What was it, he wondered. He went towards the little pearl-colored octagonal stand that had always looked to him like the work of some strange Egyptian bees that wrought in silver, and taking up the volume, flung himself into an armchair and began to turn over the leaves. After a few minutes, he became absorbed. It was the strangest book that he had ever read. It seemed to him that an exquisite raiment and to the delicate sounds of flutes, the sins of the world were passing in dumb show before him. The th things that he had dimly dreamed of were suddenly made real to him. Things of which he had never dreamed were gradually revealed. It was a novel without a plot and with only one character, being indeed simply a psychological study of a certain young Parisian who spent his life trying to realize in the 19th century all the passions and modes of thought that belonged to every century except his own, and to sum up, as it were, in himself the various moods through which the world spirit had ever passed, loving for their mere uh, artificiality, those renunciations that men have unwisely called virtues, as such as their natural rebellions that wise men still call sin. The style in which it was written was that curious jeweled style, vivid and obscure at once, full of argot and of anarchisms, of technical expressions and of elaborate paraphrases that characterizes the work of some of the finest artists of the French school of symboli uh, symboliste. There were in it metaphors, as monstrous as orchids, and as subtle in color. The life of the senses were described in the terms of mythical philosophy. One hardly knew at times whether one was reading the spiritual ecstasies of some medieval saint or the morbid confessions of a modern sinner. It was a poisonous book. The heavy odor of incense seemed to cling about its pages and to trouble the brain. 
the mere cadence of the sentences, the subtle monotony of their music, so full as it was of complex refrains and movements elaborately repeated, pronounced in the mind of the lad, as he passed from chapter to chapter, a form of reverie, a malady of dreaming that made him unconscious of the falling day and creeping shadows. Cloudless and pierced by one solitary star, a copper-green sky gleaming through the windows. He read on by its wan light till he could read no more. Then, after his valet had reminded him several times of the lateness of the hour, he got up and, going into the next room, placed the book on the little Florentine table that always stood at his bedside and began to dress for dinner. It was almost nine o'clock before he reached the club, where he found Lord Henry sitting alone in the morning room, looking very much bored. "'I'm so sorry, Harry,' he cried. "'But really it is entirely your fault. That book you sent me so fascinated me that I forgot how the time was going.' "'Yes, I thought you would like it,' replied his host, rising from his chair. "'I didn't say I liked it, Harry. I said it fascinated me. There is a great difference.' "'Ah, you have discovered that,' murmured Lord Henry, and they passed into the dining-room. Chapter 11 For years Dorian Gray could not free himself from the influence of this book, or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that he never sought to free himself from it. He procured from Paris no less than nine large paper copies of the first edition, and had them bound in different colors, so that they might suit his various moods and the changing fancies of a nature over uh, of a nature over which he seemed at times to have almost entirely lost control. The hero, the wonderful young Parisian in whom the romantic and the sci uh, scientific temperaments were so strangely blended became to him a kind of prefiguring type of himself. And indeed, the whole book seemed to him to contain the story of his own life, written before he had lived it. In one point, he was more fortunate than the novel's fantastic hero. He never knew, never indeed had any cause to know, that something that somewhat grotesque dread of mirrors and the polished metal surfaces and still water which came among the young Parisians so early in his life, and was occasioned by the sudden decay of a bow that had once, apparently, been so remarkable. It was with an almost cruel joy, and perhaps in nearly every joy, as certainly in every pleasure, cruelty has its place that he used to read the latter part of the book with its really tragic, if somewhat over-emphasized, account of the sorrow and despair of one who had himself lost what in others and the world he had most dearly valued. For the wonderful beauty that had so fascinated Basil Hallward and many others beside him seemed never to leave him. Even those who had heard the most evil things against him, and from time to time strange rumors about his mode of life crept through London and became the chatter of the clubs, could not believe anything to his dishonor when they had him. He had always the look of one who had kept himself unspotted from the world. Men who talked grossly became silent when Dorian Gray entered the room. There was something in the purity of his face that rebuked them. His mere presence seemed to recall to them the memory of the innocence which they had tarnished. They wondered how one so charming and graceful as he was could have escaped the stain of an age that was at once sordid and sensual. Often, on returning home from one of those mysterious and prolonged absences that gave rise to such strange conjectures amongst those who were his friends, or thought that they were so, he himself would creep upstairs to the locked room, open the door with a key that never left him now, and stand with a mirror in front of the portrait that Basil Hallward had painted of him, looking now at the devil and a at the evil and aging face on the canvas, 
and now that the fair young face that laughed, uh, and now with the fair young face that laughed back at him from the po uh, polished glass. The very sharpness of the contrast used to quicken the sense of pleasure. He grew more and more enamored of his own beauty, more and more interested in the corruption of his own soul. He would examine with minute care, and sometimes with a monstrous and terrible delight, the hideous lines that seared the wrinkled forehead or crawled across, around the heavy, sensual mouth, wondering sometimes which were the more horrible, the signs of sin or the signs of age. He would place his white hands beside the coarse, bloated hands of the picture and smile. He mocked the misshapen body and the failing limbs. There were moments, indeed, at night, when lying sleepless in his own delicately scented chamber, or in the sordid rooms of the little ill-famed tavern near the docks, which, under an assumed name and in disguise, it was his habit to frequent. He, had, uh, he would think of the ruin he had brought upon his soul, and a pity that was all the more poignant because it was purely selfish. But moments such as these were rare that curiosity about life which Lord Henry had first stirred in him as they sat together in the garden of their friend seemed to increase with fast, uh, gratification. The more he knew, the more he de uh, desired to know. He had mad hungers that grew more ravenous as he fed them. Yet he was not really reckless, at any rate, in uh, his relations to society. Once or twice every month during the winter, and on each Wednesday evening, while the sea, uh, the uh, yeah, while the season lasted, he would throw open to the world his beautiful house and have the most celebrated musicians of the day to charm his guests with the wonders of their art. His little dinners and the settle, uh, settlings of which Lord Henry always assisted him were noted as much for the careful selection and placing of those invited as for the exquisite taste shown in the decoration of the table, with its subtle symphonic arrangements of exotic flowers and embroidered cloths and antique plate of gold and silver. Indeed, there were many, especially among the very young men, who saw, or fancied that they saw, in Dorian Gray, the true realization of a type of which they had often dreamed in Eton or Oxford days, a type that was to combine something of the real culture of the scholar with all the grace and distinction and perfect manner of a citizen of the world. To them he seemed to be of the company of those whom Dante described as having sought to make themselves perfect by the worship of beauty. Like Gautier, he was one for whom the visible world existed. And certainly, to him, life itself was the first, the greatest of the arts, and for it all the other arts seemed to be but the preparations, fashion by which what is really fantastic becomes for a moment universal and dan uh, yeah, dandyism, which in its own way, is an attempt to assert the absolute modernity of beauty, had, of course, their fascination for him. His mode of dressing, the peculiar styles that from time to time he affected, had their, remark had their marked influence on the young exquisites of the Mayfair balls and Pall Mall club windows, who copied him in everything that he did, and tried to reproduce the accidental charm of his graceful, though to him only half-serious, fopperies. For while he had been too ready to attempt the position that was almost immediately offered to him in his coming of age, and found indeed a subtle pleasure in the thought that he really might become that of uh, to the London of his own day, what to imperial Neronian Rome, the author of the Satyri uh, Satyricon, once had been, yet in his inmost heart he desired to be something more than a mere arbiter 
elegantierian, uh, elegantierum, to be consulted on the wearing of a jewel or the knotting of a necktie or the conduct of a cane. He ought to elaborate some new scheme of life that would have its reasoned philosophy and its ordered principles and find in the, dis the spiritualizing of the scenes its highest realization. The worship of the senses has often, with uh, and with much justice, been decried, men feeling a natural instinct of terror about passions and sensations that seem stronger than themselves, and that they were, are conscious of sharing with the less highly organized form of existence. But it appeared to Dorian that the true nature of the senses had never been understood, and that they had remained savage and animal merely because the world had sought to share them, in uh, starve them into submission, or to kill them by pain, instead of aiming at making them elements of a new spirituality, of, a wit uh, of which a fine instinct for beauty was to be the dominant characteristic. As he looked back upon man moving through history, he was haunted by a feeling of loss, so much had been surrendered, and to such little purposes. There had been mad, wistful rejections, mysterious forms of self-torture and self-denial, whose origin was fear and whose result was a degradation infinitely more terrible than that fancied degradation from which, in their ignorance, they had sought to escape. Nature, in her wonderful irony, driving out the uh, anchorite to feed with the wild animals of the desert and giving to the hermit the beasts of the field as his companions. Yes, there was to be, as Lord Henry had prophesied, a new hedonism that was to recreate life and to save it from that harsh, uncomely puritanism that is, hap uh, that is having, in our own day, its curious revival. It was to have its service of the intellect certainly, yet it was never to accept any theory of system that would involve the sacrifice of any mode of passionate experience. Its aim, indeed, was to be experience itself, and not the fruits of experience, sweet or bitter as they might be. Of the asceticism that deadens the senses, as of the vulgar uh, prof uh, profligacy, that dulls them. It was, oh, sorry. Things are bumping into things. Of the asceticism that deadens the senses, as of the vulgar profligacy that dulls them, it is to know nothing. But it was to teach man to concentrate himself upon the moments of life that is itself but a moment. There are few of us who have not, sometimes, wakened before dawn, either after one of those dreamless nights that make us almost enamored of death, or one of those nights of horror and misshapen joy, when through the chambers of the brain sweep phantoms more terrible than reality itself, an instinct with that vivid life that lurks in all grotesques, and that lends to Gothic art its enduring vitality. This art being, one might fancy, especially the art of those whose minds have been troubled with the malady of reverie. Gradually, white fingers creep through the curtains, and they appear to tremble <clears throat> in black fantastic shapes. Dumb shadows crawl into the corners of the room and crouch there. Outside, there is the stirring of birds among the leaves or the sound of men going forth to their work, or the sigh and the sob of the wind coming down from the hills and wandering round the silent house as though it fears to wake the sleepers, and yet must needs call forth sleep from her purple cave. Veil after veil of thin dusky gauze is lifted, and by, uh, and by degrees the form and colors of things are restored to antique pattern. The wan mirrors get back their mimic life. The, frameless, uh, the flameless tapers stand where we had left them, and beside them lies the half-cut book that we had been studying, or the wired flowers that we had worn at the ball, or the letter that we had been afraid to read, or that we had read too often. 
Nothing seems to us changed. Out of the unreal shadows of the night comes back the real life that we had known. We have to resume it where we had left off, and there steals over us a terrible sense of the necess necessity for the continuance of energy in some wearisome round of stereotyped habits or a wild longing, it may be, that our eyelids might open some mornings upon a world that had been refashioned anew in the darkness for our pleasure, a world in which things would have fresh shapes and colors and be changed or have other secrets, a world in which the past would have little or no place, or survive at any rate, in no conscious form of obligation or regret, the remembrance even of joy having its bitterness and the memories of pleasure their pain, uh, of pleasure their pain. It was the creator of such words as these that seemed to Dorian Gray to be the true object of amongst the true objects of life, and in the, his search for sensations and true ob, uh, and yeah, sensations that would be at once new and delightful, and possess that element of strangeness that is so essential to romance, he would often adopt certain modes of thought that he had. Uh, that he knew to be really alien to his nature, abandon himself in their subtle influences, and then, having as it were caught their color and satisfied his intellectual curiosity, leave them with that curious indifference that is not incompatible with a real ardor of temperament, and that, indeed, according to certain modern psychologists, is often a condition of it. It was rumored to him once that he was about to join the Roman Catholic Communion, and certainly the Roman ritual had always a great attraction for him. The daily sacrifice, more awfully really, uh, more awful really than all the sacrifices of the antique world, stirred him as much as it, of, by its superb rejection of the evidence of the senses as by the primitive simplicity of its elements and the eternal pathos of the human tragedy that it sought to symbolize. He loved to kneel down on the cold marble pavement and watch the priest in his stiff flowered dalmatic, slowly and with white hands moving aside the veil of the tabernacle or rising aloft the jeweled lantern-shaped monstrance with that pallid wafer that at times one would fain to think is indeed the Pani Celestis, the bread of angels, or robed in the garments of the Passion of Christ, breaking the host into the chalice and smiting his breast for his sins. The fuming censers of, uh, that the grave boys in their lace and scarlet tossed into the air like great gilt flowers had their subtle fascination for him. As he passed out, he used to look with wonder at the black confessional and long to sit in the dim shadow of one of them and listen to men and women whispering through the worn grating the true story of their lives. But he never fell into the error of arresting his intellectual developments by any formal acceptance of creed or system, or of mistaking for a house in which to live, an inn that is but suitable for the sojourn of the night, or for a few hours of a night in which there are no stars and the moon is in travail. Mysticism, with its marvelous power of making common things strange to us, and the subtle and, uh, an antinomony. <laughs> oh, goodness. Hang on a second. Antinomiony. Antimoniamism. Aha! antinomianism that always seems to accompany it moved him for a reason a uh, season and for a season he inclined to the materialistic doctrines of the darwinism uh, a darwinismus movement in germany and found a curious pleasure in tracing the thoughts and passions of men to some pure pearly cell in the brain or some white nerve in the body delighting in the con conception of the absolute dependence of the spirit on certain physical conditions, morbid or healthy, normal or diseased. Yet as he 
as had been said to him before, no theory of life seemed to him to be of any importance compared with life itself. He felt keenly conscious of how barren all intellectual con uh, speculation is when separated from action and e experiment. He knew that the senses, no less than the soul, have their spiritual mysteries to reveal. And so we would now study perfumes and the secrets of their manufacture, distilling heavy scented, uh, heavily scented oils and the burning odorous gums from the east. He saw that there was no mood of the mind that had not its counterpart in the sensuous life, and set himself to discover their true relations, wondering what there was in frankincense that made one mystical, and in ambergris that stirred one's passion, and in violets that woke the memory of dead romances, and in musk that troubled the brain, and in champac that stained the imagination, and seeking often to elaborate a real psychology of perfumes, and to estimate the several influences of sweet-smelling roots and scented pollen-laden flowers, or aromatic balms, and of dark and fragrant woods, of spikenard that sickens, of hovenia that makes men mad, and of aloes that are said to be able to expel melancholy from the soul. At another time he devoted himself entirely to music, and in a long latticed room with a vermilion and gold ceiling and walls of olive green lacquer, he used to give curious concerts in which mad gypsies tore wild music from little zithers or grave yellow stained Tunisians, plucked at the stained strings of, an, of a monstrous lute while grinning, uh, while grinning Africans beat monotonously upon copper drums, and crouching upon the scarlet mats, slim turbaned Indians blew through the long pieces of reed or brass and charmed, or feigned to charm, great hooded snakes and horrible horned adders. The harsh intervals and shrill discords of barbaric music stirred him at times when Schubert's grace and Chopin's beautiful sorrow and the mighty harmonies of Beethoven himself fell unheeded on his ear. He collected together from all parts of the world the strangest instruments that could be found either in the tombs of dead nations or among the few savage tribes that had survived Con, uh, contact with Western civilization, and loved to touch and try them. He had the mysterious uh, Juru Paris of the Rio Indians that women are not allowed to look at and that even youths may not see till they have been subjected to fasting and scour uh, scourging, and the earthen jars of the Peruvians that have the shrill cries of birds and flutes of human bones, such as Alfonso de Oval, heard in Ch uh, Chile, and the sonorous green jaspers that are found near Cusco, and given forth a note of singular sweetness. He had painted uh, gourds filled with pebbles that rattled when they were shaken, the long clarin of the Mexicans, into which the former, uh, performer does not blow, but through which he inhales the air, the harsh touré of the Amazon tribes that is surrounded by the sentinels who sit all day long in high trees and can be heard, it is said, at a distance of three leagues, the teponatsli that has two vibrating tongues of wood and is beaten with sticks that are smeared with an, uh, with an elastic gums obtained from the milky juice of plants the yotla bells of the Aztecs that are hung in clusters like grapes, and a huge cylindrical drum covered with the skins of great serpents, like the one that Bernal Diaz saw when he went into the Cortes into the Mexican temples, and of which doleful so, uh, sound he has left us so vivid a description. The fantastic character of these instruments fascinated him, and he felt a curious delight in the thought that art, like nature, has her monsters, things of bestial shape and of hideous voices. 
Yet after some time he wearied him of them and whirled, uh, and would sit in his box at the opera, either alone or with Lord Henry, listening in rapt pleasure to Tonhauser and feeling in the prelude to that great work of art a presentation of the tragedy of his own soul. On one occasion he took up the study of jewels and appeared at a costume ball of, as Anne de Joyeuse, admiral of, of France, in a dress covered with the five hundred and sixty pearls. <clears throat> this taste enthralled him for years, and indeed may be said never to have left him. He would often spend a whole day settling and resettling in their cases the various stones that he had collected, such as the olive green uh, chrysoberyl uh, that turns red by lamplight, the, the uh, simophane with its wire-like line of silver, the pistachio-colored peridot, it actually looks more like pickle juice, rose pink and wine yellow topazes, Oh, hello, Mr. Brightside. I hope you slept well. Um, I will chat in a moment. Let's see. Rose pink and wine yellow topazes, carbuncles of fiery scarlet with tremulous four-rayed stars, flame red cinnamon stones, orange and violet spinels, and amethysts with their alternate layers of ruby and sapphire. He loved the red gold of the sunstone and the moonstone's pearly whiteness and the broken rainbow of the milk opal. He procured from Amsterdam three emeralds of extraordinary size and richness of color and had a turquoise de la vie roche that was the envy of all the connoisseurs. He discovered wonderful stories also about jewels in Alfonso's Clerical Disciplina, uh, oh, Clericalis Disciplina, a serpent was mentioned with eyes of real uh, jacinth, and in the romantic history of Alexander, the conqueror of Amathia, was said to have found in the Vale of Jordan snakes with colors of real emerald growing on their backs. There was a gem in the brain of the dragon, Philostratus uh, told us, and by the exhibition of golden letters and a scarlet robe, the monster could be thrown into a magical sleep and sta uh, slain. According to the great alchemist Pierre de Bonifie Boniface, the diamond rendered a man invisible, and the agate of India made him eloquent. The Corn uh, Cornelian appeased anger, and the hyacinth provoked sleep, and the amethyst drove away the fumes of wine. The garnet casts out demon, and the hydro hydropicus derived the moon of her color, or deprived. The selenite waxed and waned with the moon, and the melosius that discovers thieves could be affected only by the blood of kids. I'm assuming they're talking about uh, baby goats. Leonardus Camillus had seen a white stone taken from the brain of a newly killed toad that was a certain antidote against poison. The bezoar that was found in the heart of the Arabian deer was a charm that could cure the plague. In the nest of Arabian birds was the Aspilates that, according to Dome uh, Domecritus, Timocritus, ha, kept the wearer from any danger by a fire. The king of Ceylon rode through the city with a large ruby in his hand at the ceremony of his coronation. The gates of the palace of John the priest were made of sardi, sardius with the horn of the horned snake in rot, so that no man might bring poison within. Over the gable were two golden apples in which were two carbuncles by night. In Lodge's strain ro strange romance, A Marguerite of America, it was stated that in the chamber of the queen one could behold all the chaste ladies of the world, in chaste out of silver, looking through fair mirrors of chrysolites and carbuncles, sapphires and green emeralds. 
Marco Polo had seen the inhabitants of Zipangu place uh, of Zipangu place rose-colored pearls in the mouths of the dead. A sea monster had been enamored of the pearl that the diver brought to King Perozes and had slain the thief and mourned for seven moons over its loss. When the Huns lured the king into the great pit, he flew it away. Procopius tells the story, nor was it ever found again, though the emperor of Anastasius offered five hundred weight of gold pieces for it. The king of Malabar had shown to a certain Venetian a rosary of three hundred and four pearls, one for every god that he worshipped. When the Duke of Valentino, Valentinois, son of Alexander the Sixth, visited uh, Louis the Se uh, no Louis the Twelfth of France, his horse was loaded with gold leaves, according to Brantome, and his cap had double rows of rubies that threw out a great light. Charles of England had ridden in stirrups hung with four hundred and twenty-one diamonds. Richard the Second had a coat valued at thirty thousand marks, which was covered, uh, which was covered with balas rubies. Hall described Henry the, the Eighth on his way to the tower previous to his coronation as wearing a jacket of raised gold, the placid embroidered with uh, the placard embroidered with diamonds and other rich stones, and a great bauder like about his neck of large balasses. The favorite of James I wore um and the favorite of oh sorry the favorites of James I wore ear rings of emerald set in gold filigrane. Edward the Second gave to Piers Gaveston a suit of red gold armor studded with jacinth, a collar of rose uh, gold roses set with turquoise stones and a skull cap parsemé with pearls. Henry the Second wore jeweled gloves reaching to the elbow and had a hawk glove sewn with twelve rubies and fifty-two great orients. The ducal hat of Charles the Rash, the last Duke of Burgundy of his race, was hung with pearl-shaped pearls, oh, pear-shaped pearls, not pearl-shaped pearls, that would be silly, with pear-shaped pearls and studded with sapphires. How exquisite life had once been, how gorgeous in its pomp and decorations. Okay, I will do that. Uh, even to read of the luxury of the dead was wonderful. Then he turned his attention to the embroideries and to the tapestries that performed the office of frescoes in the chilled rooms of the northern nations of Europe. As he investigated the subject, and he always had an extraordinary faculty of becoming absolutely absorbed for the moment in whatever he took up, he was almost saddened by the reflection of the ruin that time brought on beautiful and wonderful things. He, at any rate, had escaped that. Summer followed summer, and the yellow jonquils bloomed and died many times, and nights of horror repeated the story of their shame, but he was unchanged. No winter marred his face or stained his flower-like bloom. How different it was with material things! Where had they passed to? Where was the great crocus-colored robe on which the gods sought, uh, fought against the giants that had uh, been worked by brown girls for the pleasure of Athena? Where the huge Viralian, uh, Valerian from Nero had stretched across Col the Colosseum at Rome that titan sail of purple on which was represented the starry sky and Apollo driving a chariot drawn by white, gilt-reined steeds. He longed to see the curious table napkins wrought for the priest of the sun on which was displayed all the dainties and viands that could be wanted for a feast. The mortuary cloth of King Silperic with its three hundred golden bees, the fantastic robes that excited the indignation of the Bishop of Pontus, and were figured with lions, panthers, bears, dogs, forests, rocks, hunters, all, in fact, that a painter can copy from nature. 
and the coats that Charles of Orleans once wore, on the sleeves of which were embroidered the verses of a song beginning, Madame, je suis tout joyeux, the musical accompaniment of the words bring, uh, being wrought in gold thread, and each note of square shape in those days formed with, with four pearls. He read of the room that was prepared at the palace at Reims for the use of Queen Joan of Burgundy, and was decorated with 1,321 parrots made in embroidery and blazoned with the king's arms and 561 butterflies whose wings were similarly ornamented with the arms of the queen, uh, ornamented with the arms of the queen, the whole worked in gold. Catherine de, Medi uh, de, Me de Medici, with a mourning bed made for her of black velvet powdered with crescents and suns. Its curtains were of damask with leafy wreaths and garlands figured upon a gold and silver ground and fringed along the edges with broideries of pearls, and it stood in a room hung with rows of the queen's devices in cut black velvet upon cloth of silver. Louis the Fourteenth had gold embroidered uh, caryatides, sure, fifteen feet high in his apartment. The state bed of Sobieski, King of Poland, was made of Smyrna, a Smyrna gold brocade embroidered in turquoise with verses from the Koran. Its supports were of silver gilt, beautifully chased and profusely set with enameled and jeweled medallions. It had been taken from the Turkish camp before Vienna, and the standard of Mohammed had stood be uh, beneath the tremulous gilt of its canopy. And so, for a whole year, he sought to accumulate the most exquisite specimens that he could find of textile and embroidered work, getting the dainty Delhi muslins, finely wrought with gold-threaded palmates and stitched over with iridescent beetles' wings, the Dhaka's gauzes, that from their transparency were known in the East as woven air and running water and evening dew, strange figured cloths from Java, elaborate yellow Chinese hangings, books found in tawny satins or fair blue veils of lassies worked into Hungary po uh, Point, Hungary Point. Sicilian brocades and half Spanish velvets, Georgian work with its gilt coin, and Japanese uh, fucosas with their green toned golds and their marvelously plumaged birds. He had a special passion also for the ecclesiastical vestments, as indeed he had for everything connected with the service of the church. In the long cedar chests that lined the west gallery of his house, he had stored away many rare and beautiful specimens of what is really the raiment of the Bride of Christ, who must wear purple and jewels of fine linen that she may hide the pallid, macerated body that is worn by the suffering that she seeks for her, and, wound, uh, yeah, and wounded by self-inflicted pain. He possesses a gorgeous cope of crimson silk and gold thread damask figured with a repeating pattern oh possessed okay figured with a repeating pattern of golden pomegranate set in six petaled formal blossoms beyond which on either side was the pineapple device wrought in seed pearls the ophrys were divided into panels representing scenes from the life of the virgin and the coronation of the virgin was figured in colored silks upon the hood. This was Italian work of the 15th century. Another cope was of green velvet embroidered with heart-shaped groups of acanthus leaves from which spread long-stemmed white blossoms, the details of which were picked out with silver thread and colored crystal. The, more, uh, the Morse bore, uh, hang on, the Morse bore a seraphic head a seraph's head in gold thread raised work. The offerings were woven in a diaper of red and gold silk and were starred with medallions of many saints and martyrs, amongst whom was Saint Sebastian. 
he was a a chasub chasubles mm. he had chasubles also of arm amber colored silk and gold silk and gold brocade uh, blue silk and gold brocade and yellow silk damask and cloth of gold figured with representations of the passion and crucifixion of christ and embroidered with the lions and peacocks and other emblems dalmatic of white satin and pink silk damask decorated with tulips and dolphins and fleur-de-lis altar frontals of crimson velvet and blue linen and many corporals chalice veils and sudaria in the mystic offices to which such things were put there was something that quickened his imagination for these treasures and everything that he collected in his lovely house were to be to him means of forgetfulness modes by which he could escape for a reason uh, for a season from the fear that seemed to him at times to be almost too great to be born upon the walls of the lonely locked room where he had spent so much of his boyhood he had hung with his own hands the terrible portrait whose changing features showed him the real degradation of his life, and in front of it had draped the purple and gold pall as a curtain. For weeks he had not been there, would forget the hideous painted thing, and get back his light heart, his wonderful joyousness, his passionate absorption in mere existence. Then suddenly, some night he would creep out of the house, go down to the dreadful places near Blue Gate Field, and stay there day after day until he was driven away. On his return, he would sit in front of the picture, sometimes loathing it and himself, but filled at other times with that pride of individualism that it's half the fascination of sin and smiling with secret pleasure at the misshapen shadow that had to bear the burden that should have been his own. After a few years, he could not endure to be long out of England, and gave up the villa that he had shared at Trouville with Lord Henry, as well as the little white walled-in house at Algiers, where he had more than once spent the winter. He hated to be separated from the picture that was such a part of his life, and was also afraid that during his absence someone might gain access to the room, in spite of the elaborate bars that he had caused to be placed upon the door. He was quite conscious that this would tell them nothing. It was true that the portrait still preserved under all the foulness and ugliness of the face its marked likeness to himself, but what could they learn from that? He would laugh at anyone who tried to taunt him. He had not painted it. What was it to him how vile and full of shame it looked? Even if he had told them, would they believe it? Yet he was afraid. Sometimes when he was down at his great house in Nottinghamshire, entertaining the fashionable young men of his own rank, who were his chief companions, and astounding the country by the wanton luxury and gorgeous splendor of his mode of life, he would suddenly leave his guests and rush back to town to see that the door had not been tampered with, and that the picture was still there. What if it should be stolen? The mere thought made him cold with horror. Surely the world would know his secret then. Perhaps the world already suspected it. For while he fascinated many, there were not a few who distrusted him. He was very nearly blackballed at a West End club for which his birth and social position fully entitled him to become a member, and it was said that no one occasion when he was brought by a friend into the smoking room of the Churchill, the Duke of Berwick and another gentleman got up in a marked manner and went out. Curious stories became current about him after he had passed his twenty-fifth year. It was rumored that he had been seen brawling with foreign sailors in a low den in the distant parts of Whitechapel, and that he consorted with thieves and coiners, and knew the mysteries of their trade. His extraordinary absences became notorious, 
and when he used to reappear again in society, men would whisper to each other in corners, or pass him with a sneer, or look at him with cold, searching eyes, as though they were determined to discover his secret. Of such insolences and attempted slights, he, of course, took no notice, and in the opinion of most people, his frank, debonair manner, his charming, boyish smile, and the infinite grace of that wonderful youth that seemed never to leave him were in themselves a sufficient answer to the calumnies, for so they termed that, uh, termed them, that were circulated about him. It was remarked, however, that some of those who had been most intimate with him appeared after a time to shun him. Women who had wildly adored him and for his sake had braved all social censure and set convention at defiance were seen to grow pallid with shame or horror if Dorian Gray entered the room. Yet these whispered scandals only increased in the eyes of many his strangers, uh, his strange and dangerous charm. His great wealth was a certain element of security. Society, civilized society at least, is never very ready to believe anything to the detriment of those who are born rich and fast, uh, uh, who are both rich and fascinating. It feels instinctively that manners are of more importance than morals, and, in an opinion, the highest respectability is of le much less value than the possession of a good chef. And after all, it is a very poor consolation to be told that the man who had uh, has given one a bad dinner, or poor wine, is irreproachable in his private life. Even the cardinal virtues cannot atone for half-cold entrees, as Lord Henry remarked once in a, a discussion on the subject, and there is possibly a good deal to be said for his, his view. For the canons of good society are, or should be the same as the canons of art, form his absolutely essential to it. It should have the dignity of ceremony as well as its unreality, and should combine the sincere character of a romantic play with the wit and beauty that makes such plays delightful to us. Is in, uh, is in sincerity such a terrible thing? I think not. It is merely a method by which we can multiply our personalities. Such, at any rate, was Dorian Gray's opinion. He used to wonder at the shallow psychology of those who conceive the ego in man as a thing simple, permanent, reliable, and of one essence. To him, man was a being with myriad lives and myriad sensations, a complex, multiform creature that bore within itself strange legacies of thought and passion, and whose very flesh was tainted with the monstrous maladies of the dead. He loved to stroll through the gaunt, cold picture, uh, picture gallery of his country house and look at the various portraits of those whose blood flowed in his veins. Here was Philippe, er, uh, Philip Herbert, described as Francis, uh, by Francis Osborne in his memoirs on the reigns of Queen Elizabeth and King James. As one who was uh, caressed by the court for his handsome face, which kept him not long company. Was it young Herbert's life that he sometimes led? Had some strange poisonous germ crept from body to body till it had reached his own? Was it some dim sense of that ruined grace that had made him so sudden, uh, that had made him so suddenly and almost without cause give utterance in Basil Hallward's studio to the mad prayer that had so changed his life? Here, in gold embroidered red doublet, jeweled surcoat, and gilt edged ruff and waistcoats, stood Sir Henry Shepherd, uh, no, Sir Henry Sherard with his silver and black armor piled to, at his feet. What had this man's legacy been? Had the lover of Giovanna of Naples bequeathed him such uh, some inheritance of sin and shame? Were his own actions merely the dreams that the dead man had not dared to realize? Here, from the fading canvas, smiled Lady Elizabeth Devereux in her gauze hood, pearl stomacher, and pink-slashed sleeves. 
a pearl, uh, flower was in her right hand, in her left clasped an enameled, col uh, yeah, enameled collar of white and damask roses. On a table by her side lay a mandolin and an apple. There were gr large green rosettes upon her little pointed shoes. He knew her life and the strange stories that were told about her lovers. Had he sometimes of her temperament in him? These oval, heavy-lidded eyes seemed to look curiously at him. What of George Willoughby, with his, curio uh, with his powdered hair and fantastic patches? How evil he looked! The face was saturnine and swarthy, and the sensual lips seemed to be twisted with disdain. Delicate lace ruffles fell over the lean yellow hands that were so overladen with rings. He had been a Marconi of the eighteenth century and the friend, in his youth, of Lord Ferrars. What was the second Lord Beckenham, the companion of the Prince Regent in his wildest days, and the one of the witness at the secret marriage with Mrs. Fitzherbert? How proud and handsome he was, with his chestnut curls and insolent pose! What passions had he bequeathed! The world had looked upon him as infamous. He had led the orgies at Car Carlton House. The star of the garter glittered upon his chest. Beside him hung the portrait of his wife, a pallid, thin-lipped woman in black. Her blood also stirred within him. How curious it all seemed. And his mother, with her Lady Hamilton face and her moist, red, uh, wine-dashed lips, he knew what he had got from her. He had got from her his beauty and his passion for the beauty of others. She laughed at him in her loose bacchanat, uh, uh, bacante dress. There were fine uh, vine leaves in her hair. The purple spilled from the cup she was holding. The carnations of the painted, and uh, of the painting had withered, but the eyes were still wonderful in their depth and brilliancy of color. They seemed to follow him wherever he went. Yet one had ancestors in literature as well as in one's own race, nearer, perhaps, in type and temperament, many of them, and certainly with an influence, uh, influence of which one was more absolutely conscious. There were times when it appeared to Dorian that the whole of history was merely the record of his own life, not as he had lived it in act and circumstance, but as the imagination had created it for him, as it had been in his brain and in his passions. He felt that he had known them all, those strange, terrible figures that had passed across the stage of the world and made sin so marvelous and evil so full of subtlety. It seemed to him that in some mysterious way their lives had been his own. The hero of the wonderful novel that had so influenced his life had himself known his curious fancy. In the seventh sa uh, chapter, he tells how, crowned with laurel, lest lighting, uh, lightning might strike him, he had sat as Tiberius in the garden at Capri, reading the shameful books of Elephantis, while dwarves and peacocks strutted round him, and the flute player mocked the swinger of the censer. And as Caligula had caroused with the, the green skirting jockeys in their stables and supped in their ivory man, uh, in an ivory manger, with a jewel frontleted, yeah, jewel frontleted horse, and as Domitian, yeah, and as Domitian had wandered through the corridor lined with marble mirrors looking round with haggard eyes for the reflection of the dagger that was to end his days, and sick with the ennui that terrible uh, tedium vitae that comes on those with whom life denies nothing, and had peered through the clear emerald at the red shambles of the circus, and then, in a litter of pearl and purple drawn by silver-shod mules, been carried through the streets of pomegranates, to the house of gods, and heard men cry on Nero Caesar as he passed by, and as Elagabalus had painted his face with colors, 
and plied the distant staff among uh, the distaff among the women, and brought the moon from Carthage and given her in the mystic marriage the sun. Over and over again, Dorian used to read this fantastic chapter, and the two chapters immediately following, in which, in some curious tapestries of cunningly wrought enamels, were pictured the awful and beautiful forms of those whom vice and blood and weariness had made monstrous or mad. Filippo, Duke of Milan, who slew his wife and painted her lips with a scarlet poison that her lover might suck death from the dead things he fondled. Pietro Barbi, the Venetian, known as Paul the Second, who sought in his vanity to assume the title of Formosus, and whose tiara, valued at two hundred thousand florins, had bought at the price of a terrible sin. Gian Maria Visconti, who used hounds to chase living men, and whose murdered body had covered uh, was covered with roses by a harlot who had fallen who had loved him. The Bourgeois on his white horse with a uh, fratricide riding beside him, and his mantle stained with the blood of Perotto. Pietro Riario, the young uh, cardinal archbishop, <laughs> archbishop of Florence, child and minion of Sixtus the Fourth, whose beauty was equaled only by his debauchery, and who received Leonara of Aragon in a pavilion of white and crimson silk filled with nymphs and centaurs and gilded a boy that he might serve in the feasts as a Ganymede or Hylas. Ezeline, whose melancholy could be cured only by the spectacle of death, uh, of death and who had a passion for red blood as other men have for red wine. The second of the fiend as was reported, and uh, one who had cheated his father at dice when gambling with him for his own soul, Giambattista Cibo, who in mockery took the name of innocent, and into those tor uh, torpid veins, the blood of three lads was infused by a doctor, uh, Sig uh, Sigismondo Malatesta, the lover of Isota, and the lord of Rimini, whose effigy was burned at Rome as the enemy of God and man, who strangled Polyn Polynessa with a napkin and gave poison to Ginevra d'Este in a cup of emerald, and in honor of the shameful passion built a pagan church of Christian worship. Charles the Sixth, who had so wildly abhorred his brother's wife that a leper had warned him of the insanity that was coming on him, and who, when his brain had sickened and grown strange, could only be soothed by Saras uh, Saracen cards painted with the images of love and death and madness, and in his trimmed jerkin and jeweled cap and acanthus-like curls, uh, Grifonetto Balioni, who slew Astore with his bride, and Simonetto with his page, and whose corn, uh, comeliness was such that, as he lay dying in the yellow piazza at Perugia, those who he had hated, uh, those who had hated him, could not choose but weep, and Atlanta, who had cursed him, blessed him. There was a horrible fascination in them all. He saw them by night, and they troubled his imagination in the day. The Renaissance knew was strange manners of poisonings, poisoning by a helmet and a lighted torch, by an embroidered glove and a jeweled fan, by a gilded pomander and by an amber chain. Dorian Gray had been poisoned by a book. There were moments when he looked on evil simply as a mode through which he could realize his conception of the beautiful thing. All right, we went a little over. I apologize for that. But we have ended our story time for today, though this last bit kind of reminds me of a book that is out right now. It's called Death by Shakespeare, and it just examines all of the ways that people have died in the tragedies that Shakespeare wrote. Yes, oh, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. So I will beckon them with the sounds of treats.
knocking. It's my stroke. Come here. My butt. Butt is knocking's uh, nickname. Maestro, you too. All right. So knocking's, you will eat up here. Come on. On my desk. Ooh, come on. These are from Corel. And Maestro, here you go too. <laughs> oh no, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Yeah, there are some interesting nicknames out there in the world. And so I will post my little uh, cat treat things. You get them all? Everybody got everything? That was from Corel. There you go. I'm glad you enjoyed that. That's it for now. All right. <laughs> Yeah, we had um, we had a dog named Sassafras, and my sister and I called her Frassias. She was a sweet dog, really happy. Um, she deserved a better life. She had some pretty heinous cysts on her, but yeah, you know the Frassias was an affectionate name. Um, yeah. Anyways, let's uh, let's. Oh, I should do have that showing. Uh, let us find somebody to raid. Does anybody have any suggestions of who to raid? Snoggings, be careful. Ah, Snoggings, be careful. That was it. Ah, fluffy butt. I sometimes call Snoggings, um, well, she's softy butt or silly, silly butt or crazy butt. <laughs> depending. Night Corral. Um, I'm going to really quickly check who is streaming and then we'll raid. Thanks you too. Um, let's see. I think we'll raid. Thanks you too. Ooh, hang on. There we go. I think we will raid Queer God. Uh, Cause, yeah, well, we could also do Kipsa Daisy. Actually, I haven't done Kipsa Daisy in a while. So I will raid Kipsa Daisy. And I will hopefully see you tomorrow and if not tomorrow then well <laughs> whenever so tomorrow's story time we are starting emerald city of oz and i might do a game stream tonight i'll keep you posted <laughs> night it's a sweetheart Sure, I the uh, the ultimates don't do anything. Mm hmm And so then they're all activated, but nothing. And um so then I have to close the game and reopen it. And um I don't know if it's one or two that have that problem. Mm hmm Stop it. I don't care. It's a story raid. What's up, story time, Sunny? How you doing? Thank you. 